Um, so just before we go to Q&A, um, we've had a lot of changes in parking on the uh, UHL site over the last number of weeks. So I invited William Shire to come and talk to us today, because uh, I know there's a lot of interest in that. So William, I'll ask you to take the floor for a few minutes. <coughs> I do actually, I always, and I don't know why I keep forgetting to say it, because this is a very important thing actually. Um, so when I, I spoke about the building momentum agreement and the fact that we all signed up to that, and one of the, I suppose, outputs of that was about um, a 1% you know, pay increase across the public sector, and then there's lots of other bargaining sectoral units that are in place as well. So that 1% um, is as we speak currently being you know backloaded onto people's pay scales. So um, we've got notification from nationally. It's done through the SAP Centre of Excellence nationally that that will be paid to us at uh, the end of October, um, November time. So depending on what pay cycle you fit into, uh, you can expect that. So that will be backdated to February 22 as well, which is very welcome. So all those arrears will be uh, front loaded on your pay slips. So something to look forward to for Christmas, perhaps. So, yeah. Thanks, Claire, for that. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and um, as uh, Helene has said, I'm here today to just discuss a little bit about the parking changes here at UHL site. Um, believe it or believe it not, UHL had the capacity and still has the capacity for 1,400 car park spaces. They're spread over a number of different sites. We have two off-site locations um, serviced by our park and ride service daily, um, which is now operating from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night. So this includes and facilitates a significant, if not all, of our cohort of clinical uh, employees who work from eight to eight. Uh, the remaining of our spaces are broken down into free spaces of just under 800 and a little over 400 then, which are in car park one, two and three for our patients and relatives who we would wish to keep that for. Um, the challenges around, obviously, parking uh, and uh, what we've heard and examined over the last number of months was the specific time that people uh, are spending in the morning time, obviously sitting in their car sometimes waiting for a space or exchanging a space with night duty folk. Um, this has been alleviated and one of the uh, main feedbacks from people that utilise the bus service is now that they get to spend an extra hour at home, either in bed or with their families or getting the kids ready for school. And this is a very valuable and when it comes to engagement, nothing could be more than spending more time at home with your family. Also, the stress of um, having you know, to orchestrate getting a particular space or getting close to is now alleviated by that. Um, we uh, also increased our car parking space for our disability um, patients and staff by 40%. And we relocated those particular disability spaces to the underground because of our inclement weather. It is obviously safer for people to have a drier location to access and egress the hospital. They're also quite close to the elevators, uh, and this is also of benefit. In the coming weeks, we will have a new digital carpooling system. Uh, and people have said that this in, in the past has been abused by people, you know, sneaking in and parking there. As I say, it's a digital system. Uh, this is monitored um, by both TV and camera, but also by how you swipe your badge. So you, it is a barrier based system that you will have to swipe your badge two different badges, even though some people might have two badges, but it does mean that you will have to have two different badges registered. Uh, so two different people People will have to be in the vehicle. This is giving us a net balance of an increase in spaces of approximately 100 on site and this will be through a registration process and you will be able to do that in the next coming weeks. Um, in relation to the time-saving elements, um, utilising the carpooling system or the, sorry, the uh, park and ride system at the moment has uh, estimated at the moment that it can save people up to 40 minutes a day. Uh, and somewhere in the region of 20 euro a week in uh, fuel costs. And at present time and fuel are probably two most expensive things that we have. They're also facilitating with that is the safety issue. We know that one of our, uh, what we call is unregulated or unplanned uh, car parking spaces, which was an overflow space, was so far away that people were and did feel volatile or vulnerable at night. And now that has been eliminated because the bus will pick you up outside the hospital gate, outside the hospital main entrance, and drop you at a location in either of the two particular sites. So that's also a benefit to other people. Again, 
parking is specific and we cannot and probably will not be able to deem a car park space for every single person every single time they come to the site but the executive team uh, and management team for OSD and others are working really really diligently to provide the best possible service for the staff and we hope that people would engage with it and 99% of the people that are engaging with it have a very positive outlook on what it has done for them and in some cases as I said life changing in terms of the time that they spend doing that. So again we're welcome to any questions uh, through Elaine and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks William. I might invite the speakers then to uh, just take our seat and uh, we'll go to Q&A. So I've got a couple of questions that have come in online but does anybody in the room want to start with some questions? Okay while you warm up I'll start with a couple then that's all right. Um, so the first question we have in is can clinics for COVID-19 boosters be set up on hospital sites along with the flu vaccine clinic? Um, so that isn't something that we have done uh, here today, but we are actually going to look at that because it came up yesterday at our executive management team and um, by some of the clinical directors and obviously it was raised on the floor as well just to say that you know, it would be easier if we could provide um, boosters here on site. So I know that uh, Declan who um, is just left for another meeting, but he was looking at, um, at it and I would also talk to Laura about it. Um, and so the, the CDCs at the minute, are they're running quite a lot of different uh, vaccinations at the moment. So they have monkeypox on a Monday, they're doing their flu, they can't do the flu and the um, COVID together. So we'll have just have to see what, and they're also doing the um, residential units as well. Um, so they have, they have a lot of, all their days are kind of taken up at the moment. We will certainly look at it. It will increase the number. I know nationally, I was on a national call yesterday, they did say that the number of both um, the flu uptake this year and COVID boosters are really low. So it's something that we do really have to try and promote because this was the, their concern thing. We end up with a crisis situation when you have flu and COVID together. So um, we will definitely look at that, yes. Thanks, Marie. Any questions from the room? Uh, I just have a question on the news request. Uh, staff will find it difficult to register and then for password retrieval, it's kind of a difficult process. Yeah. I know that's a national thing, but people yeah. look at it really hard when they do actually get to log in to actually get their passwords up and working. And then when they, when they access it, no one's using it, like most of my staff are really pushed to get it. But none of no us can really use it properly, especially with the annual leave requests. It confuses people the 7.5 hours when they work 12 hours in a day. Yes. So that kind yeah. of that kind of confuses people, but no one's using it. So even if they do have apps, they are registered as the actual user numbers are probably way less than the 50. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So um, that question just was arranged in Interrip, and I suppose the difficulty of registering um, online and getting passwords and that set up. And then the other issue was around the 7.5 hours when people work 12 hours. Um, a day on the system and the way it's configured. So I suppose what I would say to you, absolutely, and I've heard that feedback already um, on some of the routers that we've been doing about the registration piece. So I know we set, the registration piece is looked after by um, national staff, COE, and you have to apply through, and you need to have an email address. So um, absolutely, I knew that back in the summer there was delays of about four weeks, and. Uh, Again, I was kind of briefed and we escalated that as an issue for ourselves and that had increased, or sorry, decreased rather. So um, I will follow up on that again because I understood that there, there should be no more delays, that they had, they had some staffing issues and they had issues, I suppose, in terms of their capacity and ability to deliver um, in a timely manner. So um, that's one thing. The other issue then, just in relation to the, the 7.5 hours um, on the system, so that's the way it's configured. And again, I don't have the direct answer, but I will talk to, to Roseanne, because the way the system is actually operated, it calibrates overnight. 
So even if I go in now to apply for annual leave, it's showing my annual leave as a deficit. Um, that's because it actually uploads every night at 12 o'clock, so you get your leave pro rata, you have to work to kind of get your leave. So that's one issue, and that's not something that we can configure, that's just the way the system is configured. It shouldn't prevent you, you know, your line manager for approving your leave. Um, but the piece around the seven, so I just know myself the way mine is configured, like, you know, I don't know your screen. So we can follow that up. If you want to leave your details for me, and I can get somebody Another to make contact. Um, the, the, the line manager, the group of my yes. sign up, and they're all assigned to the wrong person. And yeah. I put in the two line manager form, and I've heard no feedback. There's still a lot of my system, and it's about the money. Okay. Yeah, and that's a real, like, I've heard, yeah, that's a real issue as well. So I suppose some of these issues are, are legacy issues, and I suppose while NISRP came into town, perhaps the system um, configuration wasn't, um, there's lots of legacy issues in terms of how the system was configured, and that, I suppose, lots of issues going back to when we used to have PPARs in place and so on. So it's the transition over to the new system. Um, but again, if you give me your details, and we can look and try and follow up for you directly. Okay, we have another question in the room. Okay, we have uh, another question in online, um, and it's in relation to uh, working from home policy. So another one for you there, uh, Lorraine. So the question is, um, when, do you know when it's going to be available, and how might that impact on staff retention if it is possible to work from home? Yeah, it's a really it's important one actually because um, it came up a lot actually in our staff survey about being remote working. And I suppose some rules are very suitable for it and some rules aren't. And um, there is legislation that is about, it hasn't been passed yet and it's still going through the rigours. And you might have heard even recently they were making some amendments to the legislation in terms of the right to refuse and so on on part of the employer. So um, it has to be a national policy, I suppose, for us. But we were, and I was told that it would be in September. Obviously, September has gone and passed now at this stage. So um, as soon as we have it nationally, you know, different to any policy that comes down, we will roll it out. And I suppose we do see it as an important uh, piece for staff retention. And um, it's very much on our radar. OK. Um, we've no more questions from anybody on, um, online. So is there any final questions in the room before we close? No? Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah, I just oh, sorry. Your brief is not questions, but um, <laughs> it's also worries me um, that you might just want to say anything. So we'll be here for a while after if you want to come up individually to ask something personal. Some people are shy, so I get that. Uh, so we'll stay back for a few minutes if you want. Um, and maybe at the next one, shall we really actually ask you all to bring a question with you? So just on the, on the car parking, just to say, and on the capital plan, which we'll show you at the next roadshow, um, we have a plan for multi story car park because a lot of people ask about that. And we have to put a lot of work into the capital plan because the only place you can put the multi story car park is near the helipad. And so we have to build a multi story car park that has a slant. So we don't interrupt the flight path, which would be really important for our studies. But it is in the capital plan, and it will be something we will look at. In the meantime, we're trying everything we can, and thanks to you for all the buses. People who take the bus say it's working, but we do know we have trouble. We have a lot of residents living around us in housing estates who are not happy with us parking in their in their front garden um, and are writing directly to me on it. So you just have to be careful around that because we had that before and cars got damaged and we don't want that for staff either. So people get a bit irate So just be careful of that. Thank you everybody for your attention and, um, and attendance this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.